I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, A New Way to Live, The Absolute Gospel, No Other Way. The Absolute Gospel, No Other Way. Do I look a little bit darker to you this morning? It's getting a little bit for me to get used to. I probably shouldn't have distracted you this way. But our, our platform lights are, are not working today. So normally I'd have this beautiful spotlight that would help my 45-year-old eyeballs to read my paper and to keep with my notes. So if I start saying something crazy, you know, it's because I can't see it very well or whatever. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that you didn't call your eye doctor tomorrow and say, hey, things are getting dark in my life and I think I need an exam. Sylvia threw herself on the bed once more under the burden of a familiar guilt. She just could not shake off that feeling that God was pushing her away. Her mind raced with thoughts of the conversations of the day, of of bad attitudes, of failures, of things that she had not done good enough, all of which contemned her spirit even farther and kept her away from rejoicing in the Lord like the Bible talks about. She loved the Lord. She desperately wanted to obey Him, and she grieved deeply each time and each day that she fell short. Maybe if she would read her Bible more, she thought. Maybe if I'd I'd take a moment and I'd read read some chapters now, she thought. Or, Or maybe if she would pray more, God would find her more acceptable. Or maybe if she would give the gospel to more people, or if she would dress more conservatively, or if she would give up some things. Perhaps if she would serve more in a volunteer fashion at the church, perhaps... Perhaps it was just more, Sylvia thought. Perhaps if she would do more, God would accept her. Graciously, the soothing gift of sleep surrounded her. Do you connect with Sylvia? Can you be honest enough this morning that sometimes, maybe many times, you connect with Sylvia's thought life? Do you go through her thought processes as you considering, as you consider your standing with God? Would it surprise you if I told you, in connection with the book of Galatians that we are preaching, that Sylvia, I don't mean this mean towards her, she is a fictional character, that Sylvia is a legalist who needs to understand a new way to live. Sylvia is indeed saved. Her faith and trust are on Jesus Christ alone. But legalism has slipped into her thought process of what it takes to have a right and accepted standing with God. Would you turn please to Galatians Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. In your Bible, Galatians 2. It's on page 1242 if you have an old Schofield Bible. It's about three-quarters of the way back, or if you're using a device, it is tap-tap, scroll down, drop screen, tap-tap, and you're there. Would you stand, please? Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 18. Galatians two eighteen. We're coming off in an argument here. We've preached up to this verse. Verse 18, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now look up here a moment. It's an argument between Peter and Paul. And uh, Paul was rejecting Gentile Christians, believers, because they wouldn't live according to the ceremonial law by receiving Christ by afterward living for Christ. The Christianity. So he separated from them. He wouldn't eat with them, acting like they were doing the wrong thing. Paul is confronting him and arguing with him. And he's here at the end of this, it's really the end of the argument. He is saying, If you build again, Peter, those things which you destroyed, that is li- trying to live by the performance of keeping the law. You know, if you try to rebuild that kind of thing in verse number 18, you know, you, you make yourself a transgressor, which can mean one of two things. Either, you know, either I'm making up rules and God is pleased with the Gentiles. I am actually condemning myself, condemning them because I'm making up fake rules that you have to live by as a Christian. 
Or it could mean by, by rebuilding, by living those performance things, by adding things to the simple Christianity of Jesus Christ, you are sinning. You're creating a Christianity that is not a real Christianity. You're sinning by living by all these additions to God's word of how to live as a Christian. So let's go on. It says, For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh or in my body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't live by the law. I don't live by, you know, man-made standards, by trying to live up to something. I live by the faith of the Son of God now, Peter. He loved me. He gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. You may be seated. These verses are the conclusion of that argument about legalism that the Apostle Paul was confronting Peter about. Peter certainly believed in salvation by faith in Christ alone. That was made real clear to Peter. I was reminded this week, you know, Peter is the one that saw that vision come down. And there's all kinds of animals and all kinds, and, Jesus, and God says, take and eat, you know, and the, all these different varieties of animals and creeping things or whatever. They represented Jews and Gentiles, you know, and Peter says, I'm not going to eat that stuff. You know, I'm a Jew. I know dirty stuff is coming. I've never eaten a lobster in my life, you know, and that's, that's actually a legitimate, you know, creeping things, lobster. Okay, I've never eaten anything. I'm not going to do that. The Lord says, hey, what I have accepted, don't you condemn. And he wasn't just talking about food, all that, though that opened up for Peter to be able to eat ham after that. He was talking about people. He was talking about Jews and Gentiles. So Peter knew. Peter knew. And he had, he had, he had been at that council at Jerusalem. He knew, but he knew that salvation and living for for God was in faith, by faith in Jesus Christ alone, but in practical living, he blew it. He went to this city of Antioch, and there he was pressured by some legalizing people, and he separated himself from the the Gentile Christians because they weren't keeping the law. Verse 18 says that he was rebuilding the things that he destroyed, you know, when he came to Christ, and Paul strongly rebuked him. This all came because of this group in the early church that came on strong called Judaizers. And that's just a a big $100 word, but it means that they were legalizing, they were adding stuff to salvation by Jesus Christ alone. Look at me. There is no other authentic gospel than the fact that you are a sinner, Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and he rose again to give you forgiveness and justification, and putting your faith and trust in him alone saves you. There is no other gospel. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's the only thing to make you forever a child of God, forever right with God. Adding anything or taking away from that message is poison. All you need is Christ and what he did for you to make you forgiven, justified, forever forgiven of your life thing, sins and, and right with God. Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. But these legalizers came in and says, oh, 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 it's great that you have Jesus, but then you need to do this, 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 this. And it was all Jewish ceremonial things. It was all adding stuff. It was all, you know, you can only eat this way, dietary laws. And you have to be circumcised, you know, or it, you're not a person of God. You know, that's crazy us, but, you know, there's some Jewish, that's huge Jewish culture and what, how God was dealing with things in the Old Testament. So there's all these kind of things. What, what you wear, you can't wear cotton and wool at the same time. All this kind of stuff. We discussed two kinds of legal, legalism and how it applied to us in this chapter, how it applies to us here in 2000. 16, first of all, salvation legalism that adds anything to the absolute gospel of justification by faith in Jesus Christ alone. In verse 16, if you look down with your eyeballs at verse 16, makes that really clear. I mean, it's just nailed. It is by faith, no other thing. Faith in Jesus and what he did. You know, he is the one was my substitute. I am saved and righteous through him. Salvation legalism is adding to the requirements of salvation. Maybe it's good works. I've had people tell me, you know, before, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus, plus I do, blunt, 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 blunt. The do is not what saves you. And even suggesting that, even by saying that, it shows that the guy's trusting in the do. He's not just trust, trusting in the Jesus. He's not just trusting in the done. That's pretty good, do and the done. All right? 
Maybe, uh, you know, salvation legalism are, are things like trusting in sa- the sacraments and religious deeds. You think if you do this, and if you light this candle, and if you do this with beads, and you do this, whatever, this somehow adds to the whole thing that you're, you're going to be saved and live forever with God. That's, that's legalism. That, that, is, that is not the gospel, okay? Adding things like baptism. You know, there is baptism, this immersion of by the Holy Spirit, that I'm immersed in Christ. That's when I'm born again. I'm, I'm baptized in the body of Christ. When I, when I, this, we just happen to have this open here. When I, after I trust Christ and when I'm baptized by water, it is making a public confession that my Savior is Jesus Christ and I'm trusting in his, his death, his burial, his resurrection coming up out of the water. It's not saying that water's holy, It's not saying that that water helps me to be saved. It's not saying I need to be baptized to be saved. It is saying my hope and my faith is is entrusted to Jesus Christ. Okay? And if you add something on top of Christ, you got legalism. Being a part of a certain church, you know, is often said, oh, but you have to be part of the holy blah, 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 blah church. All right? We got problems if you have to be a Baptist in order to get to heaven. You know? There's all these jokes about, you know, this room in heaven and, and nobody disturbs these people and what's inside the room is a bunch of Baptists, but they don't know that anybody else is there, okay? All right, being a part of a certain church or, or being continually uh, good, this idea of I have to keep it. Well, you didn't do anything to earn it, Jesus did, and you can't do anything to keep it, all right? Jesus don't need your help in order for you to be saved, you know what I mean? You know, his blood pretty much took care of it all. But then there's another kind of legalism, and that's kind of a sanctification legalism. You know, Peter was saved here, and the legalism that he was engaging in by not eating with the Gentiles was more of a sanctification legalism. You know, it adds requirements, standards, rules, applications beyond the straightforward commands of Scripture to a uh, a believer's Christian walk in order for them to think that they have good standing with God. Do more. It's Sylvia's problem, Okay. Do more. If I do more, if I do more, God will like me more, whatever. These are generally, these things that are taught and and bought into are generally external kind of things. Exactly how you should dress, for instance. Or or, uh, uh, what you should, exactly how much you should give. Or serve the Lord. Or your exact hair length. Or a particular way your music must sound, etc., etc., etc. Now, please understand, there are certainly biblical precepts and principles that govern them. But when you, when you add restrictions and you add definite points beyond what the clear scripture says, obviously, that is called sanctification legalism. Then you're putting control upon people that you have no right to put control on. Christ didn't tell you to do those things. God didn't tell you. To do. And you know what I'm fond of saying? You know, some of us are right of God. We're on the right side of God. We're more conservative than God is. It's man-made requirements. Legalism comes from self-dependency. You want to do something to make yourself right with God. It comes from pride. It comes from a desire to look towards self or man as earning or performing before God rather than God being the one who makes us acceptable to him. Do you hear what I said? Salvation and the Christian walk is an understanding that God is the one who makes us acceptable to him. And I'm not performing to get there. Pride that controls others. In verse 16, as you see verse 16, let's, uh, you, know, you, you, you see what Paul said, knowing the man is justified by the works of the law, uh, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. He began, begins to lay this rock-solid foundation of faith in Christ being the only thing necessary to be saved. And as we come to these new verses in verse 19 through 21 this morning, they drive the point home to us. Uh, truths that happened at salvation. Things happen when you receive Christ your Savior. Things happened there that shows that you are saved and need to add nothing to it. And he begins in these verses by by showing you these analogies by the analogies of things that are alive and things that are dead. Actually, the opposite of that. Of things that are dead and things that are alive. And how you were dead and how you are alive now. Not by keeping rules but by what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Point number one this morning, when I trust Christ for salvation, I am dead so that I can live. Okay, look 
think with me in verse 19, for I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. The verse says this strange phrase, through the law, I am dead to the law. Through the law, it's, it's as if it is making the law a tool or a vehicle that brings me to be dead to it. So it's like the law is a tool or the law, you know, all these commands of, of uh, ceremonial commands, even the moral law, to bring me to the point teaching me that I am dead to that law. What am I talking about? How is, how is the law a death tool? Well, you remember that all those detailed, burdensome, ceremonial Jewish laws were never intended to save an individual trying to keep them. And really, the law acted a different way. It acted like a schoolmaster, like a teacher, trying to teach all those people who are trying to keep it perfectly that it's impossible. It's a fool's errand. It's futile. You cannot have standing with the perfect God by living perfectly. You can't be like him. You can't be perfect by yourself, by your body, nothing that you, we have some disciplined people in this congregation, some people that are incredibly self-disciplined. No matter what kind of self-discipline that you throw at trying to keep God's law, you will fall short. You cannot do it. The law is the tool that teaches us that, that it is impossible to be saved by it. Even the moral law uh, portion that we call the Ten Commandments uh, does this to us now. We realize it's impossible for anyone in here, or anyone in the world, or anyone in history to live out the Ten Commandments perfectly without ever failing. It cannot happen. We cannot do it. There's sinfulness inside of us. The law exposes me. It's a tool that teaches me that I can't live it perfectly. It's a, it, through the law, I learn that I'm dead to the law. It brings me to the conviction of failing God, verse 19. The law then makes it obvious to me that if I can't live it by performance to please God, there has got to be another Savior. Something else has got to work because this ain't working. For hundreds of years, the law taught the Jewish people that as they would realize individually I can't live up to God. I can't live up to God. I can't live up to his rules. I can't live up. There's got to be another savior. The law itself became a great evangelist to show us the holiness of God, seeing all the rules and the commands and confess that we need a savior outside of the law because we can't live up to the law. In a lot of ways, that law is the greatest evangelist that teaches us our need for Jesus to see how, how far short we fall. Paul says, through the law, I realize I became dead to the law. And so the end of verse number 19, you, you, you conclude that I reject trying to keep the law perfectly anymore. I'm dead to that law. It doesn't work. I look rather for the Savior. I don't try to keep adding more, Sylvia. I don't try to get more stuff. I can't keep the sacraments. I can't do this stuff, this church and whatever. I can't live up. I need a Savior outside of myself who does something to me, not me to him. And by doing this, of course, by finally coming to the place where you say the law doesn't work, I am dead to the law, I can't be saved that way, you're made alive to God. The, the end of the verse. I die to the law and look instead, trusting the Savior who alone can make me alive to God. Look at point number two here in the verses. When I trust Jesus, okay, verse 20, when I trust Jesus, I am dead again in another way. You're dead again in another way. That I might live another way or a different way than trying to live up to God. A new way to live. That's the title of the message. A new way. And now we start talking about this new way to live. Look at verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by performance and adding more. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by becoming more conservative so that I'm more spiritual so God will accept me. And the life which I, which I now live in the flesh, now here it is, here's the mindset. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by faith on Him who did what I could never do for myself. Who loved me and He gave Himself for me. Verse 20 is freedom. Verse 20 is Christ doing it all. 
Verse 20 is Sylvia coming to the place where she realized that she cannot perform before God, but Jesus already has. Paul is playing off the idea in verse number 19 of being dead, and he says he is also in another way dead. He's dead to the law, but he's also dead with Christ. He is crucified with Christ. And one of the things he means is this, that old law Pharisee, you know, listen, Paul, as far as doing stuff to impress God, would put us all to shame. When you read his biography, this man was a man who was the legalist of legalists. He was incredibly self-disciplined. He was incredible about learning the law and living the law. He incredibly went to the nth degree to lay his life down, totally surrender his life, so that he could focus on living and impressing God by rules, by, by the law. But it came to the point where he says he realized that never could do anything for him and that he would count all those things as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. <laughs> they never help me, Paul says. So when he says he's crucified with Christ, and he plunges in verse 20, one of the first things he's, he means is that he's, he, he is no longer that old law Pharisee. He, that was gone. He's dead. And, and now he has taken up a new identity, and it, it's with Jesus Christ. But there's more meaning in this crucified with Christ. Think of it. What does it mean? I am crucified with Christ. And it's each one of us. You put your name there. You know, Mark and Judy and all your names. Put your name there. I am crucified with Christ. Toby. You certainly were not there in AD 33 when Jesus hung on the tree. Were you? I mean, I'm crucified with Christ. You weren't there, right? Yes. In a spiritual way in a way of God's perspective, you were there. That doctrine is called the vicarious death. And it's as just as if you were there, and it counted to you just as if you were there hanging with Jesus Christ. I am crucified with Christ. You probably have heard the word vicarious before. It is when you experience something through another person. And here's the doctrinal truth about being crucified with Christ it is, and, and why it's sufficient. You know, why my salvation, my faith in him is sufficient. It is just as if you were hanging on that tree and you were, your sin and all your life's sin literally was being crucified with Christ. The penalty of it, God's judgment upon you, was hanging on that tree that day with Jesus. You're crucified with Christ. The verb here is, I have been crucified with Christ. It's looking back at AD 33. I have been I have been crucified with Christ. Paul spoke of this vicarious death in several places. One of them is Romans 6 when he says this, knowing this that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, that the power and the penalty of sin of my life was broken by good works, by sacraments. By doing this and this and this for this church or this church or this church. No, by the cross. By what Jesus Christ did, his crucifixion on that cross. You died with him to sin and you rose with him to a brand new life. Look look at verse 21, 20, that's what it says. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I, I'm not the same anymore. When I put my faith in Jesus Christ, something happened. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, the old Toby, tried to live up. He's dead. He was still under the penalty and the power of that sin. Nevertheless, I live. I live now. I'm a new person. Oh, not, no, wait, not, 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 not the same guy. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's one of the best things that I ever heard that Jesus lives in me. It is, it is some of the greatest news ever. That by trusting simply in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to cover my sin, that Jesus came to live inside of me, and he will never leave me nor forsake me. But what is this in this argument? What is this in this argument against Peter? What's, what's the point Paul is trying to make? Everything changed the moment that you stopped trying for yourself and just trusted Jesus as your Savior. 
His Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, came to live inside of you and to accomplish by His presence what was burdensome and impossible before. Remember, legalism is the context of these passages and this, arg- this passage and what Paul is trying to say. So let's think it that way. Turn on your brains, okay? Before the commands of God were the external rules and chains. Before the commands of God were external rules and chains that were impossible to keep. But when you believe on Christ as Savior, the human legalist attempts, legalism attempts at self-righteousness fall away, and you live in reaction to the love of Jesus towards you because Jesus is inside of you and he lives to come out of you to please God from your heart. Christ is inside of me. He has changed me into a new creature that desires from the heart not to check off external rules, but to love and to respond to the love of God that has come to me. It says, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. What's that really mean? It means exactly what it sounds like. Jesus, we've been preaching John, the book of John on Wednesday nights, and Jesus is right He's right where we are, you know, he's, he's about ready to be put on the cross, and he's telling the disciples last kind of, these last kind of very important things, and he says in John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, if, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, that's explaining someone being saved, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. The Lord who cannot be contained, great Jehovah God, who cannot be contained in all the universe, says that he is living inside of you. Do you see how this is greatly different than a life of performance, of human self trying to impress God? By keeping some list of rules. This is God pleasing God through you. (laughs) This is God pleasing God through you. He's inside of you. He's come to live inside of you. And he's living out what honors him through you. It is God making you a new man or woman. Who wants from the heart as much as you want anything else. To walk in the good ways of God. He's come inside of you. And he's changed you. Now that's not saying that you don't struggle with the flesh. You know Paul was the king of Telling us how, you know, the things that he would do, he would not. And there's this big struggle. But now, praise God, there's a struggle. Praise God, Jesus is inside of me. And he's fighting against my flesh. And he's calling out inside of me to live my salvation back to God. He is pulling me. The Spirit is leading me. He wants me to do the things that please God. How much different is that than the pharisaical legalism of living up to a list? The Spirit of God is compelling me. That the ways of God are beautiful and from the heart leading me to walk in those ways, fighting against my flesh daily. This is living a life. This is the new way to live. This is living a life by in by faith in the Son of God. This is a faith walk in Christ. Christ is enough. I rest. I rest in him. What am I claiming in my staying with God? Nothing but faith in Jesus. He is enough. Can you hear the freedom of verse number 20? Can you feel the freedom in the verse? Can you feel the great freedom of living the Christian life this way? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's like Paul's telling Peter, let the chains behind. Let the bondage behind. Faith in Christ, he is enough. He's in you, Peter. He's living just the same as he's in those Gentiles. Their faith is in Christ. Let him alone. Let them live in freedom. See, Peter got off course of living this faith in the Son of God walk when he rejected the Gentiles, acting like they needed something more than Jesus. And this Christ in me living, folks, changes everything. 
Legalism will always be present in every denomination, in every church. It will always be present among Christians who struggle, and really, I think why they impress this on other people is they don't feel like their standing with God is enough, and they try to add to it and then impress those preferences and those extra rules on other people. It will always, the devil will always try to use this to take the glory off of Jesus. But you need to cry out, verse 20, Christ is enough. He is my standing. Receiving him as Savior and then following his simple commands in the New Testament is what he wants me to do. Living out the beauty of the Lord. I can rest in living this new way. Now the doctrinal side to that in verse 20 is that Christ comes to reside in you when you trust on him by faith in the crucifixion. So is there, there's this fact here, the fact that we can praise the Lord for, yes, Jesus is in me, but it gets a lot more personal than that. And Paul embraces Christ. It's like he's caught up in the realization of how great the liberty of having Jesus is. And in verse, the end of verse number 20, he says, who loved me and gave himself for me. Please let the personal side to this doctrine move in your heart. I live by faith of in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How different is that? The cold, dead impossibility of trying to perform to please God on a daily blessed basis and finding yourself falling short of the Judaizers or, or legalizers, the list you're falling short of. How, how different that is. And how that all melts away in the warmth of God's personal love toward you, of Jesus' personal love toward you who accomplished it all when he loved you and he gave himself for you. Folks, listen, this is not a performance life. It is a person life. And his name is Jesus who loved you and he gave himself for you and he fulfilled everything that you need to have blessed, rest, standing with your father, Abba, Father, that you can come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy and help in the time of need. And that you don't look to add more, or you don't have to do more and more and more to be more spiritual somehow to impress God. It's not a performance life, it's a person life. And he loves you by his sacrifice despite your shortcomings and insufficient performance. You can't escape you know, let me just say this, right? Is there ever a day as Christians that we live up to God's perfect standard? Is there ever a day that we have evangelized enough? Is there ever a day that we've prayed enough? Is there ever a day that we've read enough? Is there ever a day that we treated everybody the right way and, and uh, you know, that we had the right attitude? There's never a day that anyone could do enough for holy God, perfect God. And if that were the way to have standing, we fail every day. But there is a rest to someone who can't live up when they realize that Jesus is enough and that Jesus lived up. And the Lord wants me to enjoy my Christianity. He wants me to enjoy this faith that I have in Christ. And he wants to know that he is made up for where you are not enough. And then joy can come. You can't escape Paul's personal embrace of Jesus here who loved me and gave himself for me. Put your name right there. Who loved Toby. Who loved Chris, Frank, Mary, Margaret. What, I'm just throwing names out. Who loved me and gave himself for me. There's an incredibly personal aspect to verse number 20. It is not, it's not John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his own. Okay, that is a creation. This is a personal love that you can't get away from. That you have got to accept. That you have got to write your name there. Jesus loved you. And he gave himself for you up on that cross. Do you dare lay down 
your Sylvia legalist thoughts and practices and realize Jesus loves you without your living up to it and gave himself for you to be accepted by God without you adding anything to it? This is the context of why Paul is saying this, how he's ending this with Peter. It's why Sylvia needs to understand and what you need to understand. It is a new way to live. This living a life in our bodies, our flesh, by the faith of the Son of God, verse 20, looks like spirituality from the heart instead of uh, uh, following the Spirit of God within us that leads us to live out the straightforward Scripture with liberty that doesn't add anything to feel more spiritual. Can we read verse 20 and understand this new way to live that is about Christ and living in his love? If Sylvia and us, if we can settle this, then our conclusion will be verse 21. Here it is. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Do you understand what that means? Look up here. It it means if you are trying by your performance either to get saved or to live for God by your performance in a way that you think he's going to be good enough so he's going to like you more, okay, then you're frustrating the grace of God. Grace means a gift. It means he is doing it. And legalists frustrate the grace of God. Adding these things, this control, this stuff, this more stuff, this more spiritual, this more conservative, that do this more standard, this more Blah, blah, blah. Frustrates the grace of God. Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, and Christ is dead in vain, then, then why did Jesus even die? If I think I must add something to my salvation or sanctification to please God other than Jesus and live, Jesus living through me and, and obeying God through me, I'm frustrating the grace of God. I'm trying to add performance value to please God. And that is no longer grace anymore. It's me. This is what the Judaizers would not accept. This is what religions that add some forms uh, or things of works to salvation just doesn't understand. This is what Christians who always give in to the feeling of failing God and think they need to do more just don't understand. There is no righteousness that comes by the law or by our performance of doing more. Look at that last phrase, please. Then Christ is dead in vain. Think through what that means. If I must add anything or do anything or can do anything to make myself righteous before God, then it was pointless for Jesus to die on that cross. It was pointless. He died in vain because he was not enough. Do you understand that? If I got to do something to be righteous before God, Jesus Christ died in vain. He was not enough. Or there was some other way to be righteous. I want to close with an old hymn that was written by a co-minister with the great reformer Martin Luther. Who you got to understand, those guys, the reformers, they were in the deep throes, the darkest, darkest, you know, time, probably of the world, of legalism that said they had to be a part of this system. The Roman Catholic Church had to, had to do this. And God did this amazing thing, and he turned on the light. And some of them began realizing what the Bible said, that our justification, our staying with God, is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And this guy who wrote this, who was a co-laborer, a co-minister, that came to work with Martin Luther, was one of these men. He was a priest who'd come out of this adding something other than Jesus Christ. And this is what he wrote. It's a hymn called, Salvation Unto Us Has Come. Salvation unto us has come. By God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is our one redeemer. What God did in his law demand, and none to him could render, caused wrath and woe on every hand for man, the vile offender. Our flesh has not those pure desires the spirit of the law requires, and lost is our condition. It was a false, misleading dream that God, his law, had given, that sinners could themselves redeem. 
and by their works gain heaven. The law is but a mirror bright to bring the inbred sin to light that lurks within our nature. The law reveals the guilt of sin and makes us conscience stricken. But then the gospel enters in, the sinful soul to quicken. Come to the cross, trust Christ, and live. The law no peace can ever give, no comfort and no blessing. Faith clings to Jesus' cross alone and rests in him unceasing. And by its fruits, true faith is known with love and hope increasing. For faith alone can justify, works serve our neighbor and supply the proof that faith is living. And so I ask you as we close, will you rest in faith in Christ alone for your salvation and realize that you need nothing else? We preach this clear gospel over and over and over, hoping to penetrate the heart of someone who has come here today that by by their knowledge, with the realization or not, are trusting in themselves or any form of good works to save them. Become dead to that idea today. Trust Jesus Christ And what he did on the cross and resurrection alone to justify you from your sin. The answer is yes to that. Then will you, after you have truly come to Christ and he has come to live inside of you, will you live out that faith in Christ alone by a Christian life that that lives in the liberty of Christ, living out simply and straightforwardly faith in Christ and what the scriptures clearly say without feeling that you need to add the burdensome additions to please God. Would you bow your heads please this morning?